Brian, uh, I'm not a cosmologist. My background's in neuroscience, but I've been following cosmology for you know, 40 years or more. And what I have found fascinating is over the last, I don't know, a couple of decades, decade, there has been more of a challenge to the standard model of inflation than had been before. Inflation, of course, had a break, this breakthrough in 1980-ish with Alan Guth and, and then uh, people in Russia, Andre Linde, um, and became a standard model, but then suddenly became a lot of different attacks and they look peripheral and now they, the attacks or the different approaches look more central. So as a professional, you feel, follow the field, give, give me a sense of what's really happening on the inside. Yeah. So the important thing to know about inflation and its discontents, as I <laughs> talk about, is that it, it was kind of the dominant player in the marketplace of ideas, for, as you say, for the last 40 years. And to some, it still is. Yeah. The question is, is that healthy for the marketplace of ideas to have monopolistic overtaking of it by a single idea? Um, I would argue, no, it's not healthy. It doesn't mean inflation is wrong. The question is, what could supplant it that doesn't have the kind of difficult features that inflation puts in by hand in some cases to explain the peculiar features that were missing, the lacunae in the Big Bang Theory? Hmm. So in science, the misconception is, you know, we prove things. No, we don't prove things. We look for flaws. We look for cracks, and that's how the light gets in. Mm -hmm. And we hope to understand better the flaws in the currently accepted, you could call it a paradigm. So inflation was created as a way to patch some of the gaps, some of the lacunae in the Big Bang model, which were known for a long, long time. Yeah, several of them at the same time, simultaneously. And it's spectacularly successful at that. It wasn't predicted a priori. It wasn't predicted out of you know thin air, right, so to speak. Right. And so I think it has uh, some remarkable successes. Yeah, go, go, go through quickly which, yeah. which are the, uh, the things of, of flatness or ours. Yeah, go so, right. So the, uh, the original kind of motivation for Alan Guth uh, when he began this investigation in 1979 as a postdoc mm -hmm. about to become unemployed, so he mm -hmm. needed some, uh, some help, uh, it was to patch up a hole which suggested that the universe should be suffused with what are called magnetic monopoles, mm -hmm. which are artifacts, relics of an early, hot, dense evolutionary phase of the universe when it transitioned from different phases of domination, from radiation domination, matter domination, and different phase transitions called the electroweak phase transition, when the forces separate and become As distinct. the energy went down. As yeah. the energy that goes down, the universe cools. Um, so many particle physicists and particle cosmologists thought there should be plenty of these magnetic monopoles. We don't see any of them. Why is that? So the monopole problem was known for quite some time. The other major successes of inflation were to its ability to explain things like the flatness, mm -hmm. so-called flatness of the universe, which is why out of an infinite number of possibilities, a positively curved, it's like a, a ball or a <laughs> sphere, or negatively curved, like a Pringle chip, yeah. there's an infinite number of positive curvatures, there's an infinite number of negative curvatures, there's only one zero. Zero is unique. Zero means flat. Why is the universe flat? Why did it pick the one element out of an infinite, double infinite, infinite hmm. negative, infinite positive, <laughs> that happens to be what we observe. It's a puzzle that needs to be explained. Inflation hmm. explains that. Hmm. And more, even more significantly, inflation comes up with a mechanism by which we can have perturbations or fluctuations in the universe, without which you and I wouldn't be here because there'd be no reason for gravity to condense to make yeah, a Milky right. Way, to make a star, to make the Earth, etc. So those were the spectacular successes. Flatness, the horizon, the magnetic, magnetic and monopole, and many other solutions to, to different problems. The, 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 the problem is that inflation is not really a theory. There's no like one theory of inflation, as there is with say gravity or something, GR, even though gravity has many alternatives too, and we'll hopefully cover those some other time. But the, the fact is there's an infinite number of inflationary models, which makes it so difficult to make a concrete prediction that I, as an experimental astrophysicist, can build an experiment to test, not to mm. prove, but to rule out. Mm. And that's what our job is. Our job as experimentalists we should be exterminators. We should be <laughs> killing as many cockroach-like theories as possible. And what we're left with is the closest approximation to truth. Yeah. So why then has there been these ideas, which have been around a long time, uh, Roger Penrose's conformal theory and uh, uh, Paul Steinar's pyrotic universe and bounces and brains of uh, B-R-A-N-E-S. Uh, they've been around a long time, but they, they're suddenly having more play yeah. or more attention. Uh, is that a sociological phenomenon? I think it's a response to the one kind of most, if you like, detestable aspect of inflation, which is that it comes concomitant with the multiverse. 
and many people、mm. feel the multiverse is not only anathema to cosmology; it's anathema to the scientific method itself. Because essentially, anything that can happen, in the words of Alan Guth and Andre Linde, anything that can happen in a multiverse will happen in a multiverse. But look, I understand the challenge of the multiverse because anything that can happen must happen, and must happen an infinite number of times. That's just the nature of、right. infinity.、Mm-hmm. Uh, so why is that upsetting people? Because the the claim of the people who believe the multiverse is is that it is. It is not just a speculation, but it's the natural product, the byproduct of the inflationary theory. So, what you'd like, as and I'm approaching this from an experimental yeah, standpoint,、okay. I'd like a concrete prediction that comes from a, a a theory that is inductive, right? So, I want to be able to make some presumption that what I'm measuring can say something conclusively about the theory and the underpinnings of what it's being deduced from.、Mm. Um, in that case,、uh, it would be like you know, if in biology, sometimes you have a double helix, sometimes you have a triple helix, <laughs> sometimes you have a Google helix, <laughs>、um, and so it would make it very,、um, it would be very、uh, almost unsatisfying in a sense, as a, at a very minuscule level of importance,、uh, that you measure any particular result, say the measurement of the temperature of the microwave background,、mm-hmm. which we'll discuss.、Uh, but the microwave background, if it can be anything. It's much less powerful than if I say it comes from a specific cond- condensation、sure. of a particular element, and that allows you more predictive power. So that's the problem that causes this proliferation of alternatives to inflation. And as you said, they're not new.、Um, I like to joke everything new is old again because、yeah. I look back into the into the year you know search Google Scholar for the year negative eighteen hundred, and you find a cyclic cosmology in the Egyptian hieroglyphs. <laughs>、yeah. It's incredible. Well, it's、right. exactly like you know what we're、right. talking well, about. Well, Eastern re- religions have cyclicality as their core aspect.、Right. In fact, they've been uh, uh, opposed to Big Bang because it seems to have a non-cyclicality to it. That was just a philosophical objection. To That's、it. right. And as、uh, Steven Weinberg said, you know, the most palatable thing about the steady-state model, which was in vogue in the 1960s and sure, 50s,、sure. was that it least resembled Genesis 1:1. <laughs> He viewed that as a huge philosophical <laughs> virtue.、Right. Um, so, so these. these These new models have virtues,、uh, but they also come with vices too. And what's been so interesting to me as an experimentalist, with no, you know, kind of dog in this race,、uh, of, of which theory is right, and actually my job is to prove them all wrong,、mm-hmm. and then that'll probably be even more interesting.、Mm-hmm. Uh, is to say what are the virtues, what are the vices, and which ones can we make not proofs of, but definitive statements to exclude portions thereof. For、mm-hmm. example,、uh, inflation predicts a background of gravitational radiation. Uh, these other models do not. Therefore, measuring a background of gravitational cosmic pr- primordial gravitational waves, not from black holes and spiraling、right. together, primordial gravitational waves, that would be definitive disproof of the conformal cyclic model of Sir Roger Penrose, the model of Anna Egis and Paul Steinhardt called bouncing cosmological models, the ekpyrotic model of Neil Turok and Paul Steinhardt, et cetera, et cetera. So this, the string gas cosmologies of Robert Brandenburg or Conrad、mm. Vafa,、mm. these would be exciting to rule those out because we only have so much time in the day in our life <laughs> to disprove different theories, and hopefully it gets us, as you say, closer to truth. We and and they、these. they won't prove evolution correct; they would prove it's all. Alternatives wrong, which still, which maybe elevates inflation, but still does not prove it. That's right. They wouldn't prove inflation wrong. They would instead exclude regions that could have been true but are not.